Welcome to Wicked Shizuku's Reviews, bringing you a southern perspective on books, movies, music, and much, much more. Stick around for a while, you just might hear something wicked. Well, hello again, and welcome back to Wicked Shizuku's Reviews, and we are on our Monday Reads. So, I hope everyone had a good weekend. I hope everyone is doing well. You've been sleeping well. And uh, so, we shall jump into our inaugural addresses, and this time, we will be going through James Buchanan's inaugural address. And by the way, it is episode 81. Okay. And to show you a quick portrait of James Buchanan. March 4th, 1857. Fellow citizens, I appear before you this day to take the solemn oath that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and to the best of my ability preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. In entering upon this great office, I must humbly invoke the God of our fathers for wisdom and firmness to execute its high and responsible duties in such a manner as to restore harmony and ancient friendship among the people of several states and to preserve our free institutions throughout many generations. Convinced that I owe my election to the inherent love for the Constitution and the Union which animates the hearts of the American people, let me earnestly ask their powerful support in sustaining all just measures calculated to perpetuate these, the richest political blessings which heaven has ever bestowed upon any nation. Having determined not to become a candidate for re-election, I shall have no motive to influence my conduct in administering the government except the desire ably and faithfully to serve my country and to live in grateful memory of my countrymen. We have recently passed through a presidential contest in which the passions of our fellow citizens were excited to the highest degree by questions of deep and vital importance. But when the people proclaimed their will, the tempest at once subsided and all was calm. The voice of the majority, speaking in the manner prescribed by the Constitution, was heard. An instant submission followed. Our own country could alone have exhibited so grand and striking a spectacle of the capacity of man for self-government. What a happy conception, then, was it for Congress to apply this simple rule that the will of the majority shall govern to the settlement of the question of domestic slavery in the territories. Congress is neither to legislate slavery into any territory or state, nor the, to exclude it therefrom, but to leave the people thereof perfectly free to form and regulate their domestic institutions in their own way, subject only to the Constitution of the United States. As a natural consequence, Congress has also prescribed that when the territory of Kansas shall be admitted as a state, it shall be received into the Union with or without slavery, as their Constitution may prescribe at the time of their admission. A difference of opinion 
has arisen in regard to the point of time when the people of a territory shall decide this question for themselves. This is happily a manner of but little practical importance. Besides, it is a judicial question which legitimately belongs to the Supreme Court of the United States, before whom it is now pending, and will, it is understood, be speedily and finally settled. To their decision, in common with all good citizens, I shall cheerfully submit whatever this may be, though it has never been my individual opinion that under the Nebraska-Kansas Act, the appropriate period will be when the number of actual residents in the territory shall justify the formation of a constitution with a view to its admission as a state into the Union. But be this as it may, it is imperative and indispensable duty of the government of the United States to secure every resident inhabitant the free and independent expression of his opinion by his vote. The sacred right of each individual must be preserved. That being accomplished, nothing can be fairer than to leave the people of a territory free from all foreign interference to decide their own destinies for themselves, subject only to the Constitution of the United States. The whole territorial question being thus settled upon the principle of popular sovereignty, a principle as ancient as free government itself, Everything of a practical nature has been decided. No other question remains for adjustment, because all agree that under the Constitution, slavery in the states is beyond the reach of any human power except that of the respective states themselves wherein it exists. May we not then hope that the long agitation on this subject is approaching its end, and that the geographical parties to which it has given birth, so much dreaded by the father of his country, will speedily become extinct. Most happy it will be for the country when the public mind shall be diverted from this question to others of more pressing and practical importance. Throughout the whole progress of this agitation, which has scarcely known any intermission for more than twenty years, whilst it has been productive, of no positive good to any human being, it has been the prolific source of great evils to the master, to the slave, and to the whole country. It has alienated and estranged the people of sister states from each other, and has even seriously endangered the very existence of the Union. Nor has the danger yet entirely ceased. Under our system, there is a remedy for all mere political evils in the sound sense and sober judgment of the people. Time is a great corrective. Political subjects, which but a few years ago existed and exacerbated the public mind, have passed away and are now nearly forgotten. But this question of domestic slavery is far graver and is of far greater importance than any mere political question because should the agitation continue, it may eventually endanger the personal safety of a large portion of our countrymen where the institution exists. In that event, no form of government, however admirable in itself and however productive of material benefits, can compensate for the loss of peace and domestic security around the family altar. Let every union-loving man, therefore, exert his best influence to suppress his, this agitation, which since the reason, recent legislation of Congress is without any legitimate object. It is an evil omen of the times that men have undertaken to calculate the mere material value of the union. Reason estimates have been presented of the Pecuniary profits and local advantages which would result to different states and sections from its dissolution and of the comparative injuries which such an event would 
inflict on other states and sections. Even descending to this low and narrow view of the mighty question, all such calculations are at fault. The bare reference to a single consideration will be conclusive on this point. We at present enjoy a free trade throughout our extensive and expanding country, such as the world has never witnessed. This trade is conducted on railroads and canals, on noble river, rivers and arms of the sea, which bind together the north and the south, the east and the west of our confederacy. Annihilate this trade, arrest its free progress by geographical lines of jealous and hostile states, and you destroy the prosperity and onward march of the whole and every part and involve all in one common ruin. But such considerations, important as they are in themselves, sink into insignificance when we reflect on the terrific evils which would result from disunion to every portion of the Confederacy, to the north not more than to the south, to the east not more than to the west. These I shall not attempt to portray because I feel an humble confidence that the kind providence which inspired our fathers with wisdom to frame the most perfect form of government and union ever devised by man will not suffer it to perish until it shall have been peacefully instrumental. By its example, in the extension of civil and religious liberty throughout the world. Next in importance to the maintenance of the Constitution and the Union is the duty of preserving the government free from the taint or even the suspicion of corruption. Public virtue is the vital spirit of republics, and history proves that when this has des decayed, and the love of money has usurped its place, although the forms of free government may remain for a season, the substance has departed forever. Our present financial condition is without a par parallel in history. No nation has ever before been embarrassed from too large a surplus in its treasury. This almost necessarily gives birth to extravagant legislation. It produces wild schemes of expenditure and begets a race of speculators and jobbers whose ingenuity is exerted in contriving and promoting expedients to obtain public monies. The purity of official agents, whether rightfully or wrongfully, is suspected, and the character of the government suffers in estimation of the people. This is, in itself, a very great evil. The natural mode of a relief from this is this embarrassment is to appropriate the sur surplus in the treasury to great national objects for which cl a clear warrant can be found in the Constitution. Among these, I might mention the extinguishment of the public debt, a reasonable increase of the Navy, which is at present inadequate to the protection of our vast tonnage afloat. Now greater than any other nation, as well as to the defense of our extended sea coast, it is beyond all question the true principle that more revenue ought to be collected from the people than the amount necessary to defray the expenses of a wise, economical, and efficient administration of the government. To reach this point, it was necessary to resort to a modification of the tariff, and this has, I trust, been accomplished in such a manner as to do little injury as may have been practicable to our domestic manufacturers, especially those necessary for the defense of, the country, of our country. Any discrimination against a particular branch for the purpose of benefiting favored corporations, individuals, or interests would have been unjust to the rest of the community and inconsistent with that spirit of fairness and equality which ought to govern in the adjustment 
of a revenue tariff. But the squandering of the public money sinks into comparative insignificance as a temptation to corruption when compared with the squandering of the public lands. No nation in the tide of time has ever been blessed with so rich and noble an inheritance as we enjoy in the public lands. In administering this important tr trust, whilst it may be wise to grant portions of them for the improvement of the remainder, yet we should never forget that it is our cardinal policy to reserve these lands, as much as may be, for actual settlers, and this at moderate prices. We shall thus not only best promote the prosperity of the new states and territories by furnishing them a hardy and independent race of honest and industrious citizens, but shall secure homes for our children and our children's children, as well as for those exiles from foreign shores who may seek in this country to improve their condition and to enjoy the blessings of civil and religious liberty. Such immigrants have done much to promote the growth and prosperity of the country. They have proved faithful both in peace and in war. After becoming citizens, they are entitled under the Constitution and laws to be placed on a perfect equality with native-born citizens. In this, in this character, they should ever be kindly recognized. The Federal Constitution is a grant from the state of, states to Congress of a certain specific powers, and the question whether is that whether this grant should be liberally or strictly construed has more or less divided political parties from the beginning. Without entering into the argument, I desire to state at the commencement of my administration that long experience and observation have convinced me that a strict construction of the powers of the government is the only true as well as only safe theory of the con of the government oh sorry as well as only safe theory of the constitution whenever in our past history doubtful powers have been exercised by congress these have never failed to produce injurious and unhappy consequences many such instances might be adduced if this were the proper occasion. Neither is it necessary for the public service to strain the language of the Constitution, because all the great and useful powers required for a successful administration of the government, both in peace and war, have been granted, either in express terms or by the plainest implication. Whilst deeply convinced of these truths, I yet Consider it clear that under the war-making power, Congress may appropriate money towards, toward the construction of a military road when this is absolutely necessary for the defense of any state or territory of the Union against foreign invasion. Under the Constitution, Congress has power to declare war, to raise support and, and support armies, to provide and maintain a navy, and to call forth the militia to repel invasions. Thus endowed in an ample man manner with the war-making power, the corresponding duty is required that the United States shall protect each of them, the states, against invasion. Now, how is it possible to afford this protection to California and our Pacific possessions except by means of a military road through the territories of the United States, over which men and munitions of war may be speedily transported from the Atlantic states to meet and to repel the invader? In the event of a war with a naval power, much stronger than our own, we should then have no other available access to the Pacific coast, because of such a power would instantly close the route across the isthmus of Central America 
it is impossible to conceive that whilst the constitution has expressly required the congress to defend all the states it should yet deny to them by any fair construction the only possible means by which one of these states can be defended besides the government ever since its origin has been in the constant practice of constructing military roads it might also be wise to consider whether the love for the union which now animates our fellow citizens on the pacific coast may not be impaired by our neglect or refusal to provide for them in their remote and isolated condition the only means by which p the power of the states on this side of them the rocky mountains can reach them in sufficient time to protect them against invasion i forbear for the present from expressing an opinion as to the wisest and most economical mode in which the government can lend its aid in accomplishing in accomplishing this great and necessary work i believe that many of the difficulties in the way which now appear formidable will be in a will in a great degree vanish as soon as the nearest and best route shall have been satisfactorily ascertained it may be proper that on this occasion i should make some brief remarks in regard to our rights and duties as a member of the great family of nations in our intercourse with them there are some plain principles approved by our own experience from which we should never depart we ought to cultivate peace commerce and friendship with all nations and this not merely as the best means of promoting our own material interests but in a spirit of christian benevolence towards our fellow men wherever their lot may be cast our diplomacy should be direct and frank neither seeking to obtain more nor accepting less than is our due we ought to cherish a sacred regard for the independence of all nations and never attempt to interfere in the domestic concerns of any unless this shall be imperatively required by the great law of self-preservation to avoid entangling alliances has been a maxim of our policy ever since the days of washington and its wisdom no one will attempt to dispute in short we ought to do justice in a kindly spirit to all nations and require justice from them in return it is our glory that whilst other nations have extended their do dominions by the sword we have never acquired any territory except by fair purchase or as in the case of texas by the voluntary determination of a brave kindred and independent people to blend their destinies with our own even our acquisitions from mexico form no exception unwilling to take advantage of the fortune of war against a sister republic we purchased these possessions under the treaty of peace for a sum which was considered at the time a fair equivalent our past history forbids that we shall in the future acquire territory unless this be sanctioned by the laws of justice and honor acting on this principle no nation will have a right to interfere or to complain if in the progress of events we shall still further extend our possessions hitherto and all our acquisitions the people under the protection of the american flag have enjoyed civil and religious liberty as well as equal and just laws and have been contented prosperous and happy their trade with the rest of the world has rapidly increased and thus every commercial nation has shared largely in their success su successful progress I shall now proceed to take the oath prescribed by the Constitution.
whilst humbly invoking the blessings of the divine providence on this great people. And that was James Buchanan's inaugural address. And he only had one. Um, and he was the president that came right before Abraham Lincoln. So he was our 14th president. <laughs> Say that staggeringly. <laughs> but I shall be right back after this break. See you in a minute, everyone. And welcome back. I hope you were able to grab your drinks and go on your potty parades while uh, during the break. And 
I shall be continuing with The Art of Love and other love books of Ovid. And we shall be finishing up this go-round. Uh, we shall be finishing up book one of the loves. So we shall we shall get right into it. Non ominous Morier. Elegy number 15. The poets alone are immortal. Wherefore dost thou blame me, gnawing envy, for consuming my days in sloth, slothfulness? Wherefore callest thou my verses the employment of an idle mind? Why dost thou reproach me for not following in the footsteps of my forefathers, for not seeking? While vigorous youth permits to crown my brows with the dusty laurels of war for not studying the jargon of the law or for not prostituting my words in a dingy court of justice mortal are the works whereof thou praised my aim is glory and shall not perish so that in every time, in every place, I may be celebrated throughout the world. Mayonids shall live so long as to notice, and Ida shall endure so long as Simua shall roll his hurrying waters to the sea. The as as crayon bard too shall live while the grape ripens on the vine, while the corn shall fall beneath the sickle's curving blade, the song of Bodice shall be sung throughout the world, albeit his art, rather than his genius, is his title deed to fame. The tragic buskin of Sophocles shall never grow old. So long as the sun and the moon shall shine. Aratus will live on. So long as slaves are rogues. As fathers storm. As pimps deceive. And strumpets wheedle. Neander will not die. Aeneas. Or Aeneas. E-N. N I U S for all his artlessness and Achis with his lusty speech possess a name that time shall not lay low. When shall there dawn an age that shall know not borrow or the first ship to sail the seas? Or the golden fleece brought home by Aeson's son. When the world perisheth, then and not till then shall the works of the high souled Lucretius perish too. Titrius and the gardener gardenered crops. Anus and his droughty deeds will be read so long as Rome shall wield her scepter or the conquered world, so long as Cupid wields his fires and bends his bow, thy numbers skilled, Tibullus will remembered be in the west and in the east, the name of Gaulus shall be known to fame. And because of Gaulus, the name of Lacorus shall live on. What through devouring time wear down the flint and blunt the share of the enduring plow? Yet poetry shall never die. Let kings then and all their train of conquest yield to poetry. To poetry let the happy shores of the golden Tagus give place 
let the vulgar herd set their hearts on dross, if they will. For myself, let Apollo dis bespo bestow on me cups overflowing with the waters of the castle. Castile, let myrtle that dreads the cold adorn my brow, and let my verses ever be scanned by the eager lover. While we live, we serve as food for envy. When we are dead, we rest within the areoli of the glory we have earned. So when the funeral fires have consumed me, I shall live on, and the better part of me will have triumphed over death. So, that is the end of book one of The Loves of Ovid. However, we shall continue again sometime on a Monday read. So, if you found this educational, inspiring, or entertaining, would you give me a like, subscribe, and share? And if you happen to have any questions on any words, please leave them down in the comment box below, and I will get right back to you as soon as possible. Have a good night, everyone. Love to you.